Uh, it's wonderful to be with you all. Certainly my own congratulations to all those award winners, the ones you recognize. The whole purpose of being here, I think, could be wrapped up and I could leave the stage right now and feel we'd completed the primary mission of this place and being able to recognize those teachers, the principals, those students. That's what this is about. And I applaud this STEP program. It certainly is part of your work, Darlene. I'm sure it's part of the community learning centers. It's fabulous. Uh, there's a cutting edge, I think, to having an article that did appear in the Enquirer on Sunday, which is a lot of people have been saying, oh, this is going to go to a great talk you're going to give. And I said to a good, good friend this morning, I think the only thing I could do to really please this audience would be to do an advanced screening of Toy Story 3. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what you've got coming. Uh, I can't take time to introduce a lot of people, but there is one person, since Tom introduced Francie, that I will recognize here, and that's Krista Ramsey who's sitting at my table here. And Krista has been an inspiration to me, and I'm sure countless of you in this room, for the unique writing and insights that she's had into children, into mothers, fathers too, and into schools. And Krista, would you stand and let us recognize you for your wonderful work. I was so glad. I was so glad that you could join us here today. It means a lot to me more than you probably know. Well, thank you all for being here, allowing me to take a few minutes to talk to you about this subject, which we all know is so important, the education and the development of our youth. 25 years ago, I heard a talk which changed my life. It happened in Washington, D.C. The then Under Secretary of Labor, Labor Roger Semerod, spoke that evening about the peril which our nation would face if we did not make a dramatic improvement in the education and development of our youth. He talked about the increasing demands of the jobs to be filled. He talked about increasing global competition. In fact, having recently come back from Europe, that report probably shouldn't have surprised me. If I had read The Nation at Risk, which had been published two years earlier, I would have known what he was talking about. That report began by saying our nation is at risk, our once unchallenged preeminence in commerce, industry, science, and technological innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. If an unfriendly foreign power had attempted to impose on America the mediocre education performance that exists today, we might well have viewed it as an act of war. As it stands, we've allowed this to happen to ourselves. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think it would be hard to find a more concise summary of the situation that we face today. With, of course, the increasing challenge posed by the emergence of third world countries, with technology requiring lots more education, and with the continuing challenge we face from poverty and from a great increase in one-parent families. Now, it was about the same time that I heard Summerard talk that I finally took Francie up on her continued recommendations that I read a particular book. And this book changed my life. It was Ron Kodalak's inside the brain. I don't know how many of you read that book, but here I learned that the importance of the first three years of a child's life was not just some intuitive uh, belief, but that it was a biological reality. Kodak documented in that book that the brain, as we all now know, was hugely influenced by the emotional context in which a child lived and the early learning experiences which they had. The implication as I read the book was pretty simple. Let's do everything in our power to make those experiences in those first three years positive ones. In preparing my remarks today, uh, I've talked to more than 40 leaders in education and child development over the past couple of months. Many of you are here today, and I thank you for the time that you've taken with me. Much more than that, I thank you for what you're doing for our children. These discussions have, of course, revealed the challenges that we face. But equally, perhaps even more, they show me that there are a lot of bright spots out there that we can and we must build on. As Ginger Rhodes, principal of Hughes High School, said to me, we don't know about everything that works, but we know a lot. And I would add the question is whether we have the will and the perseverance to act on what we know to be true. Now, there are a lot of educational reforms that I could talk here today talk about national standards, we need them, pay for performance, extending the school year, how we fund secondary education, which is not so, 
But rather than that, I'm going to focus on three opportunities which I believe are to a greater degree within our control here in this community. First, let me take a moment to assess the bright spots and the challenges as I see them. The bright spots, and you'll see them on the screen, I'm happy to tell you that the graduation rate from Cincinnati Public Schools has increased dramatically from 52% in 1990 to 82% today. That is one heck of an improvement. <laughs> Moreover, we've got proof, we've got proof that all kids can learn as we see strong leadership in schools producing amazing results among even the most underprivileged children. Third, we're launching promising programs for early childhood development and impressive organization models to enable our community to better support student and school success. Now to the challenges. 30% of young people in this country are dropping out of school every year. That, ladies and gentlemen, is 6,000 every day. That's a million a year. That's like the whole city of Cincinnati is gone. The price that a high school dropout is paying is horrendous. Today, a shocking 44% are not in the workforce at all, 44%. And another 15% are underemployed. In CPS, Cincinnati Public Schools, almost half of students, grades three through eight, are testing below proficiency levels. And we see a double digit point difference between minority and non-minority students. We cannot allow this to stand. Further, we're serving a woeful one-third, one-third of the population that should be served with our early childhood development programs. And finally, we are facing a significant, and I fear, ongoing gap in government revenue versus societal needs. We are going to need to make bold changes, bold changes in the organization designs that we have and we're going to make smarter and better choices in how we spend the money we've got if we're going to be able to close this very genuine and real gap. Now, against this background, I've asked myself, what are the key learnings that I might share with you today, and what might we do? And there are three. The first is learning number one. Strong school-based leadership makes all the difference. It provides living proof, living proof that all children can learn. If I were to choose the single intervention that I'd be confident would significantly improve the education of our children, it is to have a school building led by an outstanding principal and empowered, committed teachers dedicated to the proposition that every child not only can, but will learn. Bob Sice, former principal of Hughes, put it to me very simply. We're always looking for the latest technique. This suggests we don't know the answer, but we do. We need great principals, and we need great teachers. Several years ago, I was talking to a group of interns at Procter & Gamble. When I came to the Q&A session, the young man held up his hand, and he said, Mr. Pepper, you've been in business a long time. And he paused, moving me to say, yes, sir, I have been in business a long time. What is your question? He said, in your long career, what is the single most important thing you've learned? My answer was instantaneous. Personal leadership makes things happen. And nowhere have I seen that more clearly than in our schools. Take two high schools right here in Cincinnati, Taft and Withrow University. You all know them. Through the late 1960s and 1990s, Taft was in a real mess. The dropout rate was 60%, 30% of it in the first year alone. In the last decade, I can tell you, and I don't know how many of you know this, Taft has gone through one of the most transformational changes and improvements of any school in this country. Almost all of the children still come from disadvantaged backgrounds, but that is not stopping the principal, Anthony Smith, and the teachers and the parents and the community from doing what it takes to enable these students to succeed. Their graduation rate today is close to 90 percent, and 99 to 100 percent of the students are passing each of the ninth through 11th grade tests. Those scores are right up there with Walnut Hills, which is rated as the, one of the top 100 high schools in this country. All I had to do was spend a few minutes with Anthony Smith, and I understood why this is happening. He knows every one of the 500 kids in that building personally, personally. He says it's to develop 
and critical to develop relationships. There's no limit to what you can achieve, he tells the students. You can go as far as you want to go. Anthony emphasizes student responsibility. Each student has an individualized plan informed by performance data. Every one of them sees, reviews, and sees how they're going to do better with their transcript at least 12 times during their time in high school. He talks to every single teacher, every cafeteria worker, every security worker, one-on-one, -on -one, telling each of them that you have to understand why you are here. You are here to serve young people. No wonder people like to work at Taft, as challenging as it is. Now, a similar transformation is happening at Withrow, Withrow University. When its principal, Sharon Johnson, took over that school in 2002, the proficiency test scores, the ninth grade, were ranging from a high of 35 to a low of 7. Today, over 85% of the students are passing these proficiency tests, all of them. 98% are graduating. 98% are graduating. 75% are going on to college, and another 10% are going into the military. Sharon describes the root causes of our challenge as kids without hope. You've heard a lot about that already today. Kids without hope and teachers looking for excuses. Our job, she says, and I love this, is to have students light up like a flashlight, help them see the light. Our job is to inspire them. Savetta Macon, she's the principal at South Avondale School, previously one of our lowest performing schools, is also riveted on excellence. Whatever we need to do for our children, we will do. And as she said to that to me, you know she meant it. The teachers and I are exhausted at the end of every day, but it is the kind of exhaustion that makes us look forward to coming back the next day. Her attitude toward her students is uncompromising. You will master this program. You will be prepared for high school. South Avondale is your pathway to success. It's the same everywhere. High expectations drive progress. What's the secret of these school success? You know it. It's exactly what makes for success in any organization. A strong principal leader is empowering strong teacher leaders who have a deep, deep, caring interest in children, in their learning, in their character, in their future. They are enlisting parent and community support. They are enlivened by one overarching ethic. Every child can and will learn. Now my leadership, my, sorry, my celebration of the great results achieved by the leadership in our best performing schools raises a simple question. Why can't we have more great principals and more great teachers? And that brings me to what I have concluded is our single biggest opportunity for progress, significantly improving, significantly improving the preparation and continued professional development of principals and teachers. In my opinion, the development of our principals today, nationally and locally, is woefully inadequate. It's not that we aren't doing anything, of course. We have principal performance standards in Ohio. CPS has its best principals interviewing aspiring principals. This is fine, but we are a long way from having the pipeline development and leadership training that we need for our principals. Again and again, I've heard that principals need more training and more experience in how to lead an organization, how to establish a shared vision, how to inspire the students in the community, how to make critical budget decisions, how to use data, and how to deal with maybe the toughest issue of all, personnel issues. Put simply, principals need to learn to be leaders and not just managers. Procter & Gamble spends more time on leadership development today than at any time in our history, and so does every other great company, and so should every school system. I'm happy to say that we have a very promising model here. The principals of our 16 lowest performing CPS schools are currently receiving leadership training at the University of Virginia, tapping into the resources of both the Darden School of Business and the Curry School of Education. The reports on the value of this that I've received from principals and from Laura Mitchell, who oversees this program in CPS, are very encouraging. 
There's learning here for the future. Accessing the resources of our schools of business alongside our schools of education can better prepare aspirant principals for their jobs. I understand that Larry Johnson, who's here today, is exploring this. I hope he makes it happen. It makes sense. And this is an area where business leaders can play a role too, and I know are ready to. Formal schooling will only take you so far, though, of course. Strong principal candidates should spend at least a couple of years as an assistant principal working with one of our very best principals, Craig Hockenberry, and thank you, Craig, for being here today. Principal at Euler in Price Hill describes his two years as assistant principal as by far the most important development experience he ever had. As he said, I couldn't believe the things I saw. I had to learn on the job. We all know it. We all learn on the job, especially if we're privileged to be working with a great leader. Yes, we can and we must do better in preparing great principals. Teacher training, in my opinion, needs big improvement as well, and it's not so importantly me as the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, who recently asserted that America's university-based teacher preparation programs need revolutionary, not evolutionary change. The importance of a strong teacher is well documented in its unbelievable. We all know it, but one research study has shown that having a great teacher versus a poor teacher for three consecutive years makes not a 10 point, not a 20 point, but a 50% point differential in the performance of students on performance tests. But of course, great teachers do more than just instill learning that lets you do well on a proficiency test. They do something perhaps even more important, and that is they transmit the love of learning and they transmit high expectations. I know every one of us in this room can recall vividly teachers who did that for us. As President Greg Williams, and thank you for your comments, Greg, as he has said, great teachers provide a sense of hope. They don't let students put a limit on what they can achieve due to their current circumstances. We have some good things going for us, too, in teacher training. The Mayerson Academy is a resource that will be envied by cities around this nation. And we are benefiting mightily from a $20 million grant from the General Electric Corporation to improve teacher and math skills. But we've still got big opportunities, folks. Everyone I've talked to has emphasized the need for more math and reading content in schools before teachers enter public education. But most importantly, in my opinion, and that of many, many I've talked to. Teacher education should include at least a full year of in-classroom experience as an intern paired with a great teacher. That's the only way that teachers are going to be able to learn how to engage students from where they come from. And also, it's the only way they'll really learn if they love to teach kids coming from all kinds of backgrounds. And after graduating, teachers should have continued mentoring just like those of us in business who've been successful have had. Let me make one final point about this subject of leadership, and it has to do with continuity. Continuity. Principals and teachers need to be in their jobs long enough to make their plans work. Tony Smith, over at um, Taft, told me it took him three and a half years, three and a half years at Taft, before he really felt he had the culture that he needed to have to succeed. The lack of continuity in this area to me is shocking. 16% of all the teachers in classrooms will leave their job at the end of this year, 16%. And sadly, this lack of continuity is greatest in those schools serving disadvantaged students. And in New York City, almost half of teachers are gone within the first four years moved to neighboring Scarsdale, high income, 82% of the teachers there are there after five years. Half of them are going to New York City, 82% are still there in Scarsdale. Closer to home in Cincinnati in the last 10 years, we've had four superintendents of our Cincinnati public schools in 10 years. Not one of them had a tenure of longer than three years. Can you imagine if the heads of our corporations all had tenures of three years? And that went on over an entire decade. Probably wouldn't want to invest in these companies. Observing the leadership of Mary Ronan, 
as I have had the privilege to do since she was at Kilgore. I would simply say, I hope Mary couldn't be here. You'll be here for a long time. Finally, and you've done this today in superb fashion, we need to celebrate. We need to celebrate and honor our most outstanding teachers and principals. They are not going to receive six-figure bonuses. But one thing they sure should receive is our unvarnished thanks and recognition as this organization is doing today and I hope will continue to do year after year. That's learning one. I promise you learnings two and three will not be quite that long. <laughs> but they're very important, so stick with me, please. Lesson number two is investing more in proven child care and pre-kindergarten educational programs is the best investment we can make. I and many others in this room have been saying that for 10 or 15 years, and it's absolutely true. And believe me, it is the only way we'll have any chance of having kids enter kindergarten on an equal or even close to an equal playing field. And don't they deserve that as they come into kindergarten? Yes, they do. It really is impossible for me to fully appreciate the day-to-day -day challenges which many children experience. Our community really does live in two worlds, and they're separated by only two to three miles from us as we have this wonderful dinner here in this building. In one shelter, in one world, children do not have enough to eat. They walk to school fearing gunfire, as all of us were reminded, if we needed any reminder, in reading the Cincinnati Enquirer this morning. They often encounter domestic violence. They may have a parent in jail, try to work two jobs or unemployed. It is not surprising that children from the lowest economic group, the lowest economic group, enter kindergarten with readiness scores 60% below, 60% below children from the highest economic group. I can report to you that while we still have a long way to go, we're in better shape today than I've ever seen us in in this community to make good on the opportunity and the responsibility to invest in early childhood development. The reason? We have programs that are demonstrating that they work more than we've ever had before. Every Child Succeeds is one of them. It is serving 3,000 children in our community from pregnancy to age three. Infant mortality rates among those children served have been reduced by two-thirds. 90% of the children are on track developmentally, and 70% of the moms either have a job or have gone back to school. Success by Six is providing 2,500 students with quality pre-kindergarten education. We've seen a 20% increase in the number of children achieving target reading skills entering kindergarten. And we've seen greater improvement for those children that have been in the program for two to three years rather than just one. I've been very impressed by the leaders of these programs. They're focused on continuing improvement in three areas, expanding coverage, recognizing that we're now only covering about 30% of the families that should be receiving this coverage, obtaining better data so that we can track the performance of children, not just when they're through the five years, but year by year to see how it can be improved. We have far more data today. And third, recruiting more qualified teachers and addressing their dismally low compensation. Teachers with BA degrees are sometimes now starting their jobs at salaries of $18,000 per year. They're on food stamps, just like the families whose children they're serving. It's no wonder that the turnover rate for daycare providers and child care centers is 40% per year. It's going to take more money to do this. This is the area more than any other where I feel we are going to have to invest and should more dollars. And we made a start. Led by Jim Zimmerman, who many of you know, former CEO of Macy's and founding chair of Success by Six, the Winning Beginnings campaign was launched two years ago and has raised $10 million. I've got to tell you that the need for private support is greater than ever because the state's budget challenges have wreaked havoc on early learning programs this year and will again next reducing spending by 15% and eliminating support for almost 1,000 children in our community this year. We're trying to raise money to overcome that. We've also got to be smarter in how we spend the money we do have. 
we are dramatically underinvesting in the early years. That chart shows you the rate of return from its research related to age of child. Study after study has shown that preschool programs return up to $7 for every dollar spent. Do you know what the biggest components of that difference is? I suspect you guess one, and that's lifetime income that comes from the better education. You might not guess the other, and you won't like to hear it. It's lower costs related to criminal activity. Sadly, the reality of this trade-off is clearer today than ever. This year in the state of Ohio, we will spend more than $3 billion in the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections. That is 40% of all the money we spend on K-12 education in this state. It's a choice we face. It's a choice we need to make rightly. Learning number three, it takes a community, and by community, I mean all of us. You know, over the course of American history, the school has been asked to take on more and more problems and become the solutions to more and more of the ills that we have. What's wrong with that picture? Well, it's simply that superintendents and principals and teachers simply cannot do it alone. They know it, and we know it. Kids are in school for less than half their waking hours. The environment outside school is, of course, vital to how they develop. They need services, some of which we might not appreciate. Psychiatric care, eye care, dental care, general care. They need adult role models. They need character building activities. This is why it does take a community. Churches, synagogues, businesses, social service organizations working together to achieve the shared vision of meeting individual children and family needs. Again, I think we're in a better position to make that community support happen in Cincinnati than any time I've been here. Why? Because we have new organizational programs that, while still young, are showing great promise. We have STRIVE, which is the most well-organized plan and concept I've ever seen to bring together all the support that it takes for the development of our children, prenatal through high school. STRIVE is leading the formation of alliances, which we badly need bringing together all of our mentoring, our tutoring, our after-school activity, our mental health activities, our college access as well. And very importantly, as I've learned very much over the last month, we have schools that have become community learning centers. How many of you have heard of community learning centers? Many more of you will. It's an extraordinarily important organizational concept that brings together a wide variety of needed services from existing organizations right into the school setting. And not just during the school, school day, but after school, in the summer, at night, on the weekends. Today, we have full-time mental health partners in 42 of our 52 schools. You've heard about this Great Step program, which I really learned about today. That's in 35 schools. You've seen what work that is doing as you heard those remarkable presentations from Vell and John. We have full-time resource coordinators now. You can see them up here in 23 of our public schools, with funding for that coming from the Greater Cincinnati Foundation and from the United Way. Earlier this month, I had a really great experience. I visited Euler, and what an experience it was. It was sobering, for sure, but it was exciting, and it was hopeful, and it was inspiring. I learned firsthand there the challenges that children face, but I also saw what Craig Hockenberry, the principal, and the teachers, and his staff, and the many on-site organizations were accomplishing. I visited an on-site Boys and Girls Club, right there, on-site. And I visited a center operated by the city's health department, on-site, providing full health services including routine checkups and mental health counseling. The City Recreation Council is also on site, operating after school and evening programs. And students come to the Kids Cafe for free hot meals provided by the Free Store Bank. And did you know that Euler is said to have the largest mentoring and tutoring program in this country? Well, it does. Over 350 mentors from 65, 65 different organizations. And I saw them, and you can see some pictures of tutors and students there, you can barely see it. You come out to the school, and you'll see it really well. It also houses a college access center 
that is staffed by Jobs for Cincinnati graduates and by CYC. And thanks to a wonderful gift from the Robert and Adele Schiff Foundation, an early childhood center is now being installed there that is going to have infants all the way through now to high school. Okay, you could ask, is it working? And you bet it is. Since Euler's high school program started two years ago, two years ago, there has not been one dropout at Euler. Not one. And I would, really, the contrast to that is before this program got going, less than 50% of the kids that graduated from eighth grade even got through the 10th grade. I'd like to ask Craig if he would stop. Craig, start and stand up and be recognized. Craig Hockenberry from Weather. <laughs> Craig and you and many other principals are a blessing to this community. CLCs are also bringing our arts and cultural organizations to schools in a multitude of ways which I don't have time to detail today. But it's an increasingly important role in arts education. And business partnerships are, of course, playing a very important role. Cincinnati Bell at Taft, huge difference. GE at Aiken, P&G at Hughes, to name just three of literally dozens and dozens. Yes, all these are bright spots and strive an organizational concept that we've never had before and the working together of our mentoring and our tutoring and our college access organizations and in these college community learning centers which are bringing activities together where they're needed in a way that can be overseen in a sensible way. And yet we must do more. We need, must do much more. For these programs that I've described are today reaching far less than half of our children and the families that need them. And there is wide agreement that all these efforts need to be focused even more on improving academic achievement. Doing this will involve almost every one of us, almost every one of us in this room. Obviously, many of you are dedicating your life every day to this subject. But it will involve almost every one of us in the community. And in a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to what I more and more have felt to be the gut issue. Will we act personally on the conviction that the development and the education of our children really is our top priority. Our top priority. Not someone else's top priority, but our priority. Will we actively seek out a role that we can play that will make a difference in this development and education of our children, which we all know really is the most important thing? Which finally leads to the question, how might you help? Well, certainly, first off, I'd say you can become a mentor or tutor. Many of you probably are now, and many of you have been. We need thousands more of them, thousands. When I left Orthenia Jackson at Carson School, and I asked her, what's the most important thing you can, I can do for you? She said, get me more tutors. That's the way that I'm going to get to academic excellence in this school, more tutors and reading and writing. Would you be willing to spend an hour a week to change a child's life forever? An hour a week to change a child's life forever? That, ladies and gentlemen, is the opportunity. That's what's at stake. I became a mentor 15 years ago. It has been one of the most rewarding experiences I've ever had. Kevin Andrew and his family became part of Francie's and my family. The impact of mentoring and college access programs on student lives is amazing. 98% of participating seniors graduate. 85% go on to college. Here's the opportunity, yes, to give a young person with probably few, if any, adult role models that most precious, that most valuable of gifts, your belief in them, your expectations of what they can achieve, your support to help them realize their dreams. There has never been a time when adult role relationships of this kind are as important with everything going on in the world as they are today. You can contribute to winning beginnings to help support the urgently needed expansion of programs that work in the whole every child area, early childhood area. If you're a business or a social support organization or a health organization, think about pairing up with a community learning center in your neighborhood. We've got 23. We're going to be moving to 25. We'll go beyond that, I'm sure, Darlene. Uh, these are really the answer for meeting the increasing needs 
with fewer means by bringing existing resources, not new ones, to where they're needed and where they can be most effective. And finally, you can advocate for policies that strengthen the development of outstanding principals and teachers. Any opportunity to do that, please seize it. Well, there you have it. I appreciate your sticking with me. I hope I conveyed three truths. With great principal and teacher leadership, all kids can learn. It's not a euphemism. All kids can learn. Supporting children from birth through pre-kindergarten is a great, great investment. We need to make it. It will take the community, and by community, I mean all of us, virtually every one of us, in whatever way we can, believing, but also acting on the conviction that the development of the children in our community is our highest priority. To declare the goal of enabling all of our children to develop and learn, to declare that as a challenging goal is altogether obvious. To declare that more than anything else, it will determine the future of our community is quite simply the truth. In my lifetime, we've never had more ideas on what we can do to achieve that priority. And now, as I said at the beginning, we need the will, persistence, and the courage to do it. I left with you a chart that's, uh, I call it a chart, it's a sheet, it's your table, that I would invite you to carefully look at. And please consider whether and what area you would be willing to receive more information. We would love for you to do that. And in doing so, please know that your activity will be able to influence and change the lives of countless thousands of children in this community. I would conclude by one of my favorite sayings, and it's from the Talmud, we are not required to complete the work, but neither are we free to desist from it. <laughs>